amidst the flaming rubble and the war-torn bodies. Blood and Black Rum Podcast brings you Red Hot 80s Action Summer Part 3, Back to Duty. Another heaping hunk of buff, beefy, brawny men sweating it out in the jungles in communist countries you know and love. We've got hits from Arnold, Jackie Chan, the Texas Ranger himself, and more. Stay tuned the whole month of August as we cover these action hits. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. I'm Ryan from Coalsploitation.com, and I'm joined by the co-host Martin. How's it going? Doing pretty well. We are here with a, another kick-ass uh, episode of our Red Hot 80s Action Summer, and this time it's part three, uh, which is Back to Duty. And... But how you said duty. I said duty. You're right. And I and I, I have to apologize right off the bat um, because we did have to kind of postpone this episode just a little bit. Um, I had some things going on, coming back from vacation and family visiting, so we weren't able to do it in the time that we needed to. We don't we don't schedule things in advance either. So <clears throat> when you hear an episode, we generally recorded that week. So. Well, we 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 schedule it because we plan it out whether we're doing it weekly or biweekly. Sure, you just, you just forget to tell your fam. Yeah, you, you know you forgot to tell your dad like, oh, I'm podcasting today. He just you know that's why he's like, hey, come by. Stops over. That's right. <clears throat> but we do have a fun episode for you because we are covering a sequel to a movie that we we did for the first Red Hot Eighties Action Summer, first one that we did. And this one uh, was a pick for Martin. Um, big fan of this series of films. So I said series because there's three in the series. No. No what? There's more than three. Really? Yes. Oh. Huh. I didn't realize there was more than that. There's eight. There's eight in the series. Oh. Yes. I thought there was only three. Sorry, seven. Well, I guess we'll have to continue doing Red Hot Easy Action Summer until we get through them all. Well, they're not they're not all in the eighties. That's one, true. The next one's in the nineties. Yeah. It's kind of a cheat. Um, we are covering um in a movie it has nice martial arts. Uh it has uh Chinese police. Hong Kong. It, Hong Kong police, yep. And it has a nice amount of um Police brutality in it, which is always good. I thought you were going to say fart jokes. Uh, <laughs> I get that too. Uh, poop and fart jokes as well. Um, from for the for the eleven year olds out there, it's a PG thirteen movie, but <laughs> caters to the juvenile crowd. Um, yeah, and and it's funny too because we're going to talk about this and things have changed a lot. Uh, with how, especially from the eighties, of course. Uh, but with how the public has um, relates to police films, right? Because we feel a lot different about police uh, in the 2020s. And I think that's kind of interesting how it changes the perspective of you, you when you're watching a movie like this from, from the 80s. Uh, and not only that, but like a lot of movies or a lot of TV shows – that used to have um, characters who were working on police forces or working as you know detectives or anything like that. Um, they've kind of, if 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 they still are around today, they've kind of changed the way the trajectory of their storylines. They're procedurals, morally, more or less. They're not the um, actual, they're not the actual cops. They're the CSI. Sure, C- CSI Butte, Montana. Hmm. And I was thinking too of. Um, Justified, which is uh, a show near and dear to my heart, uh, when I when it was out, like I think you know, it's twenty ten maybe. I think it came out to like uh, about five years ago, and that one was a lot about um, Raylan, who is a, U- a federal um, a U.S. marshal, and be basically abusing some of the powers that are given to him, but he's doing it in the in the you know doing good with it right like 
yeah, he's bringing, he's abusing criminals, but he's bringing the, bringing the bad guys down. And um, they've kind of, th- that show ended and then they, they brought it back for like a second, um, sort of a sequel thing that it's going on now. And they've kind of changed up that element a little bit. And they're talking about like how the police can sometimes abuse their power and um, how it doesn't, it doesn't work out in their favor because, you know, sure they want to bring down the bad guys, but when they abuse their power, you can't, you know, litigate anymore. You can't, there's no lawsuit to be made because they're going to come back and say, oh, police brutality, you're going to lose that case. So it's interesting how times have changed, um, how storylines have tried to get away from the idea that police are like this end all be all power. And, you know, per, from the perspective of the audience, you don't necessarily think that the police are good people sometimes. So, um, but the movie that we have today is classic you know, 80s police warship. It's not, uh, not like that. They got posters everywhere saying join the Hong Kong police force. Absolutely. They said they're recruiting everywhere. Um, I guess we should drop the name of this which, movie. Which, which also, too, is in the first film, too. If you don't remember from the first film, they had when they're in the offices, which is true. Like, if you were at, like, a police department, you'd probably see recruitment posters everywhere. But, like, sure. you know, you could see in the background, like, you know, out of the offices, all the recruitment posters. But, you know, it's pretty cool. Well, what we're talking about <laughs> is Police Story 2. Uh, or sometimes known. I think it's actually in, like, the credits in the movie. It's Police Story Part 2. Or Janky uh, Chan's Police Story 2. Yeah. Give, give the main credit there. Um, we covered the first one in the, the first Red Hot 80s Action Summer. And had a lot of fun with that one. Uh, it's a it's a really great movie. It's got a lot of great action scenes, stunts by Jackie Chan. Um, the end of the movie kind of shows you how they did it, some of the bloopers and stuff uh, from that original movie. And I think we all just really enjoyed it. And it also has one of those things that we talked about in Commando, which is an epic mall scene. You know, every 80s movie at the time was pulling out a mall scene. Police Story and Commando were one of them. Um, So we wanted to return to the series, do Police Story 2, because it does, it it released in 1988, uh, which is three years after the original Police Story, which uh, I think was 1985. Yeah. Um, Jackie Chan returns uh, to play his same character, um, who is Kakui. And uh, his love interest, May, is back as well. Um, Although in this one, they're having some strife. Well, they had some strife in Police Story 1. Yeah. Here, there, there's some premarital woes. And also, a, a, a missed trip to Bali, too. It's really sad. Yeah, that's that's upsetting. Especially, especially coming from somebody who just was on vacation. <laughs> Can't say what you're going through. Not really in Bali, but... Uh... I didn't say Bali, but... <laughs> Yeah. No, but so we did Police Story 1, and to kind of preface it again, you know, this isn't Ryan's forte. I do, I have, it's not like I've seen every Jackie Chan film, but one day I would love to, because I do really admire Jackie Chan's work. Uh, I do think he's a great director, great actor, great stunt coordinator. He's always a lot of fun. Police Story has always been a film of his that has stuck out, and it's one that I remember fondly, and love and it's one of my favorite films not not just action films it's one of my, or Jackie Chan films it is one of my favorite films of all time because it has such great you know martial arts such great stunts such great creativity you know the plot may be kind of eh, but Jackie Chan's character work the actors and you know the, how everything moves and is assembled is really good and I think Jackie Chan also shows too that you know he's also a, very underrated as like a writer and director too so very multi-talented and also belting out that great rips. Exactly, I was going to say that his, his singing as well. You can't yeah. you can't discount. So the man's like you know he's a five tool player of the film industry. You know if you're going to use baseball terms. <laughs> but so as I mentioned, I'm pretty sure when we did that, the whole my whole introduction when we came to Police Story was I originally saw the fir- I've always seen the first three films. To be honest with you, I've always seen Police Story one, two, and Super Cop. Um. 
and I saw them all on FX because they were, for whatever reason, instead of doing X Men two for the eight hundredth time on uh, DVD features or whatever the hell that show was called, I can't remember right now. You might. Um, they were running the police story films, dubbed obviously, and police story one and three really stuck out to me, and I remember liking them a lot. And I've seen police story one. A lot more times. I've seen it about four or five times after that. Um, I have seen Super Cop at least twice. I've only seen Police Story 2 once. And so I don't have that big of attachment to the film. And I don't have as great of a memory as uh, of this film. There are parts I do remember as I was watching it. And, you know, kind of similar feelings that came up as I was watching it. But it wasn't one that kind of stuck with me. And I think as we kind of talk about it and on the show, you'll kind of see why it might not be as memorable of a film as the first film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never seen this one before. Um, Both Police Story and Police Story 2 were new to me um, for the show. And uh, I've never seen any, clearly I've never seen any more in the series as well. Um and yeah, I, I actually am not really well versed in Jackie Chan movies either. Um, I've never really seen, you know, besides Police Story, I've not really seen much else that he's done besides uh, Rush Hour. Yeah, so yeah, you, you haven't seen Shanghai Noon or Shanghai Nights with Owen Wilson? No, I didn't yeah. see those either. No, yeah, wow, I know I missed wow. I missed out on those. No, Rumble in the Bronx. These remember like those New Line Cinema ads all the time at theaters. I do like in the nineties for Rumble in the Bronx. Jake Chan's yeah. first film coming to America, Rumble in the Bronx. Yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, I didn't really keep up with uh, Mr. Chan's output, so um, I don't know why, but just not something that I I was into at the time. But um, yeah, Police Story Two, new to me, uh, was you know obviously it's been a couple of years since we did the first one, so I was uh, just trying to remember exactly what happened in that one but uh the 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 one that we watched the the um cut that we watched the japanese cut which is on max right now um that one gives you a nice recap of all the cool things that happened in the first movie uh may, it might not help you piece together exactly the storyline of the first movie but it's like he hey here's all the you know, we sh- we we shot all these really cool stunts. We might as well use them again uh, for this movie. So they do a little recap uh, startup to this to Police Story Two, which shows you like pretty much every stunt that was really cool in the first movie. So at least you have that if you you've never seen the original. So, um, all right, let's first let's take a break. Talk about the beer. I should say drink that we have on the show today technically not a beer um instead i don't know if we have we ever done a seltzer on the show thankfully no no we've never done a hard seltzer on the show uh which is interesting um but that's what we have today we have a hard seltzer and it is by happy dad I'm going to let you take it away from here because, honestly, this Happy Dad kind of came out of nowhere for me. I'd never heard of it before, and then all of a sudden people are like, Happy Dad, Happy Dad. So I'll let you talk about why you were interested in Happy Dad. All right, ready? Mm-hmm. I look pack. <laughs> I only know about Happy Dad from, like, uh, TikToks, like the Johnny Drinks videos, you know, where... The uh, bougie asshole dad and his son, you know, drink fancy whiskeys and stuff, and he takes his ring and he taps on everything, you know. Oh, I do know that. Yes, yes. So, so that guy I know from from randomly, you know, every now and then weaseling his way into my Facebook re- reels. <laughs> uh, you know, because they they do do alcohol. There's nothing wrong with those videos. They are fun, but. That's one reason, like, where place where, like, I've seen Happy Dad seltzers, because they also do, like, you know, seltzer reviews and stuff. And uh, the main one that I know is from Cut the Activist, which uh, he's a local, as his TikTok says, uh, upstate New York ship uh, dirtbag. 
and apparently he's from around our area, like within like the, like a thirty mile radius. So it's pretty cool, and he's famous, and he's the one that gives you advice, like, "Oh, you got a hangover? Well, don't let a hangover ruin your day of drinking. So fucking drink up, asshole. Have fun." And he's holding like three different happy dads in his hand. Ah, uh, so it's like, yeah, we'll try that. And so that's it. That's basically so that's that's where it came from. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, seen TikToks, you know, those social media influencers, that kind of shit that kind of my boomer ass now, like, gets offended by, like, you know, people who make money on TikTok being so-called influencers, or I'm a Twitch streamer for life. I, I create content by sitting at my computer for five hours a day and being like, so uh, here's, I'm, I want to play the video game now. So does, like, Cut the Activist, does he have, a like, a stake in the company because he had pretty much every single tiktok i've seen he has like a, a hat or a shirt or he's holding a half like, hat or <laughs> i don't know so yeah, like that's like cool because after like after buying him like he's got to be sponsored because god damn like he ain't. he's literally like <laughs> actually you know what though he's got to be close because he's wearing a giddy grow shop shirt and that's fucking right in uh our area it's a you know, right down the street from us. So he's got to be fucking close. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that this is a happy blessing that we found this because I've never heard of them before, but getting them uh, was actually, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm happy that we know about them because for me, uh, hard seltzers don't generally do the job that much. I just, ge- when I, when, Normally, when I go for a hard seltzer, it's because I've already had like two or three beers, and I'm like, I better cool it on the calories. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna go for a hard seltzer. It's a little higher for alcohol percent. I'm gonna cool it on the calories. Like you're gonna go from there. You're gonna go for the Jenny Ruby Red Cole, so it's probably pulling in like 170 calories from four and a half percent and up into 100 calories. I mean, down to 100 calories, but five or five and a half percent. Or sure, seltzer. sure, yeah. I- I do like hard seltzers because I love. I, I'm an old man now, and I, you know, t- to drink my water. I drink seltzer like constantly. Through. Yeah, that's what I do too. And so I, I, I do love like regular seltzer, but like, I do like hard seltzers. But I would never buy them. Like, but if someone at a party was like, "Hey, you wanna you want a white claw?" I'm like, half that fucking thing." Yeah, that's it's the same for me. <laughs> I, I wouldn't pass it up. Um, I just generally don't find myself gravitating towards it. Like I. I'm not going out every time and being like I'm. I've got to buy this new hard seltzer that I've seen. Um, it's just not I something. Feel like, I feel like the seltzer trends also kind of run its course. Sure, I think it's definitely kind of uh, petering out. Now it's all about that hop water, which I've been getting into. I do like the hop water, <laughs> but in this case, the Happy Dad, um, you picked up basically a twelve pack of four different. Um, Variety, Ver, yeah, tr- t- uh, ch- d- different flavors of the Happy Dad seltzer, and I love the can too because it basically sh- it's saying hey, it's so plain and generic. It's like what you imagine if you're watching a TV show. It's like, yeah, it's oh, like uh, it's like oh, Duff. It's like it's Duff like, beer. It's like I'll have a beer or a Genesee. It's yeah, it's like yeah, beer. Or so for this, it'd be like I'll have a seltzer. Yep, I mean it. It to me, it reminds me of like all of those. Yeah. Yeah, all of the, all of those be, uh, beers that are on TV where they were obviously designed because they're not real like beer um, brands, but the label was designed to be on TV. So they're like, "I'll have a beer." Um, this one. So I don't know. Like we we're kind of all over the place with the seltzer because we're we're all drinking different ones here because there's four different ones in the pack. But I'll say that the ones that I know we've had. Um, are the pineapple uh, from this pack, which I thought was really good. It has a nice, crisp pineapple flavor uh, without any of the um, off-tasting, you know, bitterness of sh- the fake sugar uh, that a lot of other hard seltzers have, um, Bud-, Bud Light Seltzer in particular. Uh, that's one of the worst offenders, I-, I in my opinion. Whenever they do a flavored seltzer like that, it's trash. It's, yeah, it normally has pure, like, it's just pure sugar. It's like cornstarch. Yeah, it's got that terrible aftertaste of bad sugar. And 
Happy Dad does not suffer from that. It's very uh, they have a very good handle on flavor that really does match, you know, what they're saying it is, but without the bad aftertaste and with I think you said natural cane sugar too, right? Yeah. They use natural cane, cane sugar in theirs. Yeah, it's, yeah, it said it's in their uh, ingredients that it's in a car, you know, no no stevia or anything like that. Yeah, it's, it's that is cane sugar, so good on them for that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think, like, I've had the pineapple and I've had the lemon lime. I think both are really good. They have a lot of flavor for a seltzer. It doesn't have, um, it, it's a much more fruity and juicy than I would have expected from a seltzer because... A lot of times with the seltzer, you get that carbonated soda flavor, um, and then on the on the end, you get like a nice like fruit flavor, you know, added flavor to it. But I think for both of these that I've had, the lemon lime and the pineapple, the f- fruit flavor is really at the forefront. Um, very juicy, very fruity, and just a lot of um, body to the to the seltzer that I wasn't expecting. So I, I'm happy with both of these so far, and I haven't tried the watermelon or the wild cherry yet. Um, wild cherry is going to be a good test. Cause wild cherry a lot of times tastes like Robitussin cough syrup. So because that's what I'm drinking right now. Yeah, it, it's medicinal. Ah, that's that's disappointing. It's not awfully medicinal, but it's definitely like medicinal. Mm-hmm. Like like that as much as a Robitussin, but more throat lozenge. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, they're good. I mean, I wouldn't even call them juicy because they're very quenchable, drinkable, crush. Goddamn, crushable. You 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 can you can blast through these. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know they're they're pretty good. You know for a hard seltzer, they're pretty good. I still think. I kind of like White Claws, I think, more because I think they do have a nice balance between being the seltzer, but also having like, like, ooh, a little, sh- like a little bit more in the, sh- like the sugariness kind of like, you know, enhances it a little bit. Here, because of the cane sugar, you do get like the, a more authentic taste, but it is kind of a little bit more muted across from the pineapple, lemon, lime. You know that we both of us have had. It's definitely lemon lime is. I think I like. I definitely like more than pineapple. Pineapple is very muted, um, but you know it's still, they're still good. They're very drinkable, very you know, and they're enjoyable. They're very quench. You know, thirst quenching. or fri- They are very refreshing. If you were to get done like mowing a big ass lawn, weed whack, I need I need a drink. That, that it would quench your thirst because it's, it's very. Delightful. You don't taste the alcohol at all. Very, you know, it's very easy. My problem, and the wild cherry, in, in as you said, cherry is always a gamble. I do like cherry, but it's always like, is it going to be good or is it going to be medicinal? It is, but it's still, you know, pretty good. My problem is, I'm going to cut a little bit of the promo here. Uh, and it might be just because of where I bought the uh, these fucking things from. So one of our local... Uh, Providers of these sorts of beverages, imbibable beverage, <laughs> imbibable imbibable beverages. Oh. Well, as, as you were up in Maine, you pack. He stole us. <laughs> um, I went. You know, went to our. You know, where I got it from. They don't usually post prices anywhere. Like sometimes in like the six packs, they'll have like you know, you know, a sticker price on there. So like you like no like oh that's expensive. That dogfish head. One twenty minute IPA, but stay away from it. It's eighteen ninety nine. For the most part, the excuse me, not price is posted, whatever. But they're usually pretty, you know, fair. I go there, I buy this damn seltzer. They've been advertising it for forever, and I buy it. There's no goddamn signs or stickers or anywhere saying what the hell it's going to cost. I ring it up, I pay for it, I get my receipts. Twenty-seven dollars at the tax deposit because up here in New York we get the uh, deposit, not just sales tax too. I scan. What the fuck? Who is charging twenty? Uh, like if, th- like if I were in like another state and this is like eighteen dollars, so like for like you know a craft hard seltzer, fine, whatever. If I'm going on the boat and I want to treat my friends to like you know a nice really good seltzer. 
good job. This is, you know, this is pretty good stuff. $27. If this is like the going great right everywhere, fuck that. That's ridiculous. Stuff it with cornstarch instead of fucking cane sugar. <laughs> Like, that's just outrageous. I pay that, you know, you pay that amount for when we do, like, those stupid-ass Goose Island bourbon barrel raisin rice grain dog shit stouts. <laughs> I'm not going to pay $27 for and Like, it just kind of, like, it's maddening. Like, it annoys me so much. And as I was buying the shit, because they, the, they have two uh, individual 12 packs of Death Row Grape for, you know, Death Row Records. Uh, a banana, a fruit punch, and a mom-flavored one, which was raspberry, and they're in 12 packs on their own, which could be very good. They were selling them individually out of the 12 pack. I didn't know what the price was. I would have got a fret, our, our Biden's mule, a banana one, if I knew it was 250 I thought they were probably going to be $5 because of the fucking 12 pack. The guy's like, yeah, the local re- one, the local restaurants down here, they have this stuff. They charge $8 a can. And it's like, well, who the fuck is charging eight dollars a can for a twelve ounce seltzer? If you're at a restaurant, if you're at a restaurant like and this is an Italian restaurant, you're sitting around, and you're eating fucking like clams and linguine, and you're like, oh god, I get it. I want an alcoholic beverage. Oh, sir, what would you like? I'll take your eight dollar seltzer. Who? I know. That's exorbitant. Who is it for? Granted. We live in the area that, like, in the summertime, we get hit with tourists because we're right on the, uh, right in the Adirondacks and the Billion Lakes and all that, and people come up from downstate, you know, with the camps and shit. But, like, if these assholes are paying for that, fuck them and get out of here. Like, then you're ruining it. And I'm thinking, too, after, like, Labor Day and all that crowd goes on, if all that shit wasn't sold from him, he's going to be sitting on that shit till the end of time. Because the people up here drink Bush Light 30 packs. <laughs> so. <laughs> and I'll kind of laugh. But, like, yeah. That, that like, annoyed the shit out of me. And I usually don't bitch about I mean, I, I usually don't bitch about that. Because it's like, it's like if, it, you know, it is what it is. But, I mean, goddamn. Yeah. I mean, it seems a little expensive for what you get. I agree, too. I cracked the Wild Cherry Medicinal. Uh, probably my least favorite of the ones I've had so far. But well, this is good enough. Like, I do want to try the fruit punch. I want to try the raspberry. I want to try the grape. Yeah, I, I would I would try the others for sure. Well, like, if I went, I got to go somewhere else so now because I'm not paying $27 for a 12-pack of that shit. No. It's just not worth it. It's That's crazy. It's crazy. Just buy yourself some Natter Days. Yeah. No, I agree. That's that's extremely expensive. I would, I would not pay more than $16 for a 12-pack. So that's why next episode you're gonna get the cheapest shit we can get. So you're gonna buy <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna buy the Natter Days there you uh, go. Pi- pineapple lemonade thirty pack. It's thirteen. No, I'm just I'm just getting at Carl's bad. Like that's a big sign in this movie. <laughs> you saw that, but yes, I, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's get back into police story two. Talk about that. Um, the policing of story. The policing of story. Yeah. So this movie. Uh, picks up pretty much where the first one left off. Like, so again, right. like we said, with the Jap- I would say right is with the end credits of Jackie Chan's belting out Changju Wo, Hong Shu Hong. Yeah, I mean, basically, where the first one left off, this one picks up, and it's like basically after that happened, uh, we know that Jackie Chan and his and his girlfriend are together, uh, May and. His name is Kakui, by the way. Um, or Kevin, if you're watching the dub. <laughs> That's true. Kevin. <laughs> um, and then he's basically getting berated. And this is in the Japanese cut that we've seen. Because um, we, we watched the Japanese cut specifically for this one, which is the longer version of this movie. It's two hours long instead of the normal Hong Kong cut, which is an, about an hour and 40 minutes. Um, picks up, you know, where he's getting berated. Like, why did you fucking break all this shit <laughs> you know it's expensive um you know ultimately it ends with him you know basically just getting reprimanded but you know he's still on the force everybody knows he's the best he's the most i i love how stereotypical it is too because it's like we can't deal with outlaws like you and he's like i've i was told to protect and serve he's like 
you're brash and you don't think and you just act impulsively. And it's like sometimes you need to follow your heart and just protect people. And it's like you cost the taxpayer money. And he's like, the taxpayer's money is going to good service if they're being protected. It's like, like, yeah, but that was an expensive chandelier. You had to break the chandelier. It's great. I just love the fact that his fucking superior is named Raymond. <laughs> mm-hmm. well, I mean, and that whenever they address him too, they come in and they're like, "Good morning." Yes, you know, in in English too. And then, well, um, well which for people who are probably don't, don't even realize, this is still when uh, Hong Kong was under British jur- jurisdiction. Yeah, it actually and which, which which makes sense, but I mean, like you know, we're forty years removed. From and there's a, a scene, too, where Raymond's superiors, they come in, basically, it's like... Yeah, British guys. British guys, yeah. They're all, they're like... And and again, they're dubbed over in this movie. Um, but yeah, they're like, they, they're they British... It's clearly, British guys who are talking in English, and you see the dub. Yeah. But well, you know, say, but you do see that... Uh, say, sorry, there was a non, little bit of a non-sequitur, but... I mean, you do see it if you watch the first Rush Hour film. That's the plot of the first Rush Hour film is, you know, that Hong Kong is being transferred over from Britain to China. The treaty's up, and then you have this British official, you know, who's become a crime lord. He used that to his advantage. And it feel old now. Sleeping Dogs, the video game's 20 years old. That's basically the plot of Sleeping Dogs, too, you know, <laughs> where, you know, a British you know, official in the Hong Kong police, you know, is, you know, manipulating yeah continue sorry oh no i was just i was just gonna kind of go into the the plotting here so so basically you know the film kind of picks up jackie chan's character is being harassed kind of by the people the the bad the bad guys from the previous film uh which is the crime boss uh mr chu and uh his associates and they're kind of harassing him and may and you think like, oh, well, maybe that's going to be the crux of this uh, movie as well. This is, you know, it's going to be those guys again. But it's really not. It's actually involving a terrorist attack on um, a mall, basically. That capitalism is just terrorist attack on capitalism. Absolutely, um, with a bombing, and the the whole movie is effectively about bombings. Um, which is kind of a change up from the previous police story. And the funnest thing I find about these films too is the fact that like they're so skittish about using guns. Mm-hmm. Cause like here they're like fighting me out with their fist and throwing the guns away or whatever, or not, not even really using weapons. But if this was America, it's just like if Jackie Chan would just be like, please, boom. <laughs> God. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> all right. Movie over. Police story, the 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 uh, in police story two, the American version would be five. And the law, you go out there. I told you. St- <laughs> well, not only that, but like, um, there's a couple scenes too where, you know, Jackie Chan is confronted by men with guns and literally can just be blown away. And they even uh, actually like shoot a gun, but it's loaded with like mud or ink. something. Ink. Fucking yeah. ink, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and like, it could have just been just as easy to have been like, ah, we're sick of you. You know, and these, these are quote unquote bad guys too, right? Like these are, these are, yeah, these are the bad of the bad. I can't remember if they're like triads or not from like the first film. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if, I can't remember if they are or not, but they they are regardless if they are triads. They're mobsters, you know? Right. And they're, you know, you would think like in that sense, they wouldn't be pulling punches they do what they would do what they need to do but in this case you know it's almost kind of comes off as goopy they're like messing with jackie chan instead of um right yeah Friday. yeah right they're not, they're not they're not menacing they're more like kind of goofy yeah yeah i mean and i think that's you know that's like kind of the thing with the police story movies too is they pair uh some serious themes with a lot of sort of like goofy or uh, slapstick antics, right? So, like, this is what kind of like what Jackie Chan does. He's it's not necessarily super serious. Like, this is not an R movie by, either. It's a PG thirteen movie. It's not not like we're getting like some hardcore, uh, 
gangbanger action in here. What, which I mean, but I mean, somebody does have their arm and face blown off. It's true. I mean, it's true. It it does kind of go, and you see a lot of male butts. Those are man ass is always PG. Nice, nice toned man. That's right, yo. Anytime, yeah. Anytime we see a woman's, you know, a lump from a woman, whether it be breast or ass. <laughs> You're getting a hard R. Tim Lady. No, uh, but you're, you're going to say, no, you're right. Like, and I think this film is kind of guilty of it. And I don't know, like, because, like, you see that, like, in a lot of sequels, right? That have, like, a mix of, like, action and comedy. The sequels always kind of lean a little bit more into the comedy than they do the action. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Police Story does have, you know, it's funny moments with, like, the whole, you know, uh, ramen bowl, like, you know, him dicking around at the one police station with that, and, you know, uh, his fight with, like, May in the parking lot. But it's real, you know, it's more definitely more grounded and serious. It does have, like, those moments. But it's not super, you know, over, you know, cartoonishly slapstick. Police Story 2 definitely leans more into that. It's definitely more cartoony, definitely more slapstick. The humor is ever-present, you know. You wouldn't know half sometimes that there's even a fucking bomb threat going on. I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, I think, <laughs> you know, occasionally... And, and to be honest with you, too, Police Story 2, it really has a very... Um, uh, I don't know. It's just the, the storyline is, is, is really loose. Um... It's just basically about this company is getting threats, blackmail threats. They're going to bomb things. And here's Jackie Chan, supposed to be going on a trip to Bali uh, with May. And instead, he gets pulled off of it in a uh, stunt that probably should never have happened. Uh, at least now it wouldn't. Fucking, can you imagine someone, the police come in like, hey, we got to pull this guy off this plane and, you know, Keeps the plane idling. Uh, not only that, but uh, he's got another woman's passport, and she's heading off to the fucking other country. Um, not only, not, not only that, fucking them, them guilting him, like guilting him into coming back to do police work. And not only that, he already paid for the trip. They're not even talking about. Um, I know, right? They, they don't. They don't. They don't say. Listen, we don't even pay. Like five thousand, like Hong Kong dollars. I don't know. What that is. Yeah, yeah. Like you paid for this trip to Bali. We'll reimburse you. We really need to stop this. You know, right? No, they just say they just say Bali will wait. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, okay. Uh, like gonna take those tickets like to Dragon Air later. And be like, oh, I can, can I reimburse? Why they're gonna be like, oh, these are three months old. They're garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I can't. I can't believe it's. It's hilarious how they, like, basically, almost strong arm him into, be, you know, basically coming back to the to the job and they're, you know, because he's the best of the best and they're they know that they're like this is going to be a really di- difficult case to work we and they work. Ma- and they make sure constantly to yeah kind of hammer that in because the whole reason why he ends up leaving the police force is because he gets as he gets reprimanded for being a menace to society because though he is successful in pursuing these cases you know the collateral damage does add up and it's not you know worth the trouble and he gets that you know stereotypical reprimand reprimanding he gets stocked down to a you know traffic cop and then you know he eventually after getting reprimanded and reprimanded he's like i i'm i'm you know i i quit <laughs> right yeah he's he, he'd rather not do it than have to be constantly berated, but for what he's doing. So, um, they, but they, they they pull him back. They they're like, we can't do this case without. And, and that's the thing about Police Story Two that I don't really necessarily get is that they're like, we can't. This case is so difficult. This extortion and blackmail and bomb and bombing case is so difficult. We need to call in Jackie Chan from his vacation. And have him work this case, even though he's again he he resigned, uh, he's been you know basically demoted, but yet they have all these other people that are very capable, no. seem very capable. No, Uncle Bill's t- too busy taking a shit. 
Every just, time we see, every time we see him in the first tab, he's like, "I'll be right there." Oh, I can go to the bathroom. Yeah, Hell, you there. you even get to see him take a shit later. <laughs> yeah, he's he's either farting in an elevator or taking a shit. Um, <laughs> but like, I I do like that. Like, the film really tries to sell this fact that like, oh, the only person that can really solve this case is Jackie Chan for some reason. But the it doesn't the movie doesn't really give us that why that is why is jackie chan the only person that can really solve this and also too if you're from the first film like jackie chan's about a great cop because he's like the most intelligent it's because he's the most persistent and like hard yeah yeah like you know through guts grit and guile he gets through it so like i i mean i could believe you know kaichu to be a you know this ace detective but at the same time, it's not what he is. Like, he's a superstar cop because he does solve things and figure them out. But he's also, like, Chinese, you know, Hong Kong Dirty Harry. <laughs> he's yeah, like, basically. He, you know, he's going to break all the rules to get, you know, to ensure safety and, you know, peace on, peace on the island. So, And, I mean, and they've already got a, like, crack team of women uh, detectives who are, you know, undercover, um, ready to break the law at any time. Basically, they they pull in this guy who's been selling uh, dynamite and basically just beat the shit out of him in an interrogation room for really no reason too, because they're just like basically they're like, hey, we just want to know some information. He's like, ah, maybe I'll tell you. Maybe I'll tell. You. He's just smoking a cigarette, and they just start beating the shit out of him. You know, you're 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 women. I'm not gonna tell you anything. And they beat his shit out of them. All of a sudden, he's like, "Help, help!" And all of a sudden, the ones like oh, scared up. Like, we're gonna yell rape and that you do heroin. And he's like, "I'll tell you that. I need to know." And then, I know. And then Jack, he's like sitting in the fucking room. He's like, "Is this how you do your work?" And like, "Yeah, it works." And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> "Yeah, it's hilarious." It's not a not a great uh, representation uh, of the. Uh, Hong Kong police work because it's pretty blatantly br- brutality, but uh, also too because Jackie, you know, he's supposed to be our he's our he's our beacon, you know, not just through this film but also through the first film. He's supposed to be our moral compass, like our pure guide. Mm-hmm. So to have him sit there and be like, "Yeah, hey, hey, you gave him like an like an outside roundhouse kick. Now give him a spinning heel kick to the chin." To, Really ensure that he calls up that information where that dynamite is, you know. And it's not really, you know, that's not the way. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not saying that I don't. I, I don't dislike the fact that they had, you know, like these women that were kick-ass and on the police force and things like that. And I think that pulling those people in is actually pretty cool because it, it adds, like, a different perspective to the police force. Because Jackie Chan, is his character is supposed to be, like, you know, the very... um a very specific part of the police force. And these guys are very different. They're like undercover agents. They're you know very good at doing these other sorts of things. And it, it clearly the film shows literally dressed to be prostitutes, essentially. Well, that is true too. Yeah. We, we, we follow them around and we give it information, you know, it works. Pre- oh, how does that work? Works pretty good. You know? Um, <laughs> and we see in this movie, Jackie is not as good at undercover stuff, but, I do have to say, hey, I wish that, that I know. I wish, I wish Jackie always had a mustache like yeah, that. He looks That's so good. good. He looks so good with that fucking mustache. It's hilarious too, because the film kind of like makes he gets a beer, is sipping the beer, and like constantly way. fiddling with the mustache. Because right. he's just in a Carlsberg. <laughs> yeah, it could be a Carlsberg. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's hilarious. How he just keeps fiddling with the mustache, but I mean, I I would I would actually pay good money to just see a Jackie Chan movie, but he's always got a mustache. It's great. I would I would too. <laughs> Hilarious, but he's not a good undercover agent. Um, and the film kind of shows that. One thing I will say about Police Story Two that I th- I thought was kind of um detracting from the movie, and probably what made Police Story One better, and this could also potentially be part of the Japanese cut, um, which is just extended, although I don't think it really is, um, is the fact that the film has a lot more of the more mundane police work 
that Jackie is doing and other characters. Um, the mundanity of having him go undercover and work on like just like criminal investigations and do interrogations. I think that kind of detracts from the movie itself because it, this movie does have a lot less of the action scenes and the choreography that Police Story 1 had. And I feel like it 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 is a lesser movie to some extent because it is missing that. Because it's just the the storyline is just not as interesting um to watch him do that sort of like investigative work. No, no, it definitely feels like after Police Story One and you know, the next couple of films that you would do like then after that he's like, I gotta kinda go of home. <laughs> like, you know, after like him almost killing himself with like the light, you know, when he's at the end of the plea first police story we sliding down like the light ramp and the one guy that almost got killed in that whole car, car like the first opening scene where the cars are going down that what do you see in the blooper reel i didn't realize it until i was watching before this like uh the interview with jackie that whole like when the you know you watch the blooper reel and the cars are going down they're carting the one guy off that's a stunt guy that got ran over <laughs> yeah and he nearly died from that you know that stunt you know which you know, so maybe like maybe that's kind of the reason why it asked you know Armor of God, where he nearly killed himself too, uh, where I think where he broke like a almost like every bone in his body except like I don't know. Um, so maybe that's why it's toned down. The action in this film is still very good, but like sure. the the set pieces overall and like kind of the thought to them is definitely more tame. It's definitely more. It is more grounded in a sense that like. They're very mild compared to your first police story, even though what happens in the first police story is very grounded and great and amazing. And these really guttural, amazing sequences that, you know, Jackie Chan puts on. I think here, like, you're right, like, the act, like, the action doesn't definitely replace the bare bone, the bare bones plot because it's so kind of. I want to say pedantic and by the numbers, even though for it's not because it's still very good action. But it's for Jackie Chan, it's kind of you know, especially as if you watch this right after the first police story, you're gonna be like, "What the hell?" Yeah, I mean, I I think that the the stunts are still really good. There's still a few that are like, you know, you you watch and you're like, "Wow, that's 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 awesome." Um, a lot of the fight scenes are just still really well choreographed even though even if they're not like to the high points that police story one had um the choreography is still great still very fast and flashy without a lot of like cut editing to it um uh, i think like the playground scene is a really great example of him just doing stunts stunt work and fights where it doesn't necessarily need to have like extensive stunts to added to it like you know death defying stunts but it's very, it's, yeah, right. It's still, it's still it's, fast. It's, it's still it's like something you'd expect, like you, a random like yakuza encounter. Yeah, you play like a random yakuza game. It's like, oh, cheating. Yeah, and and there's still, it's still, you know, it's very fast paced. It's still electrifying. Um, so you don't necessarily need all of like the death defying stunts all the time. Um, but this film kind of gets it. Ha- it's kind of like each stunt session is really separated by a lot more mundane storyline um and and i would say that the the weakness of the movie is not just that he's doing detective work and there's not a lot of action the weakness is that i don't find the storyline that engaging um overall because it's 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 really when you stop and think about it there's not that much going on and this case should not really be that difficult um, not only that, not not only that, but I do think, it, as you said, and maybe it's because we watched the Japanese cut and not the you know Hong Kong cut. It's way too focused on like the May Jackie drama mm-hmm. and all this other ancillary stuff. Where it's not bad, but it's definitely like it definitely bogs the film down. Like you know, like it. It's interesting, but not enough to, like, you know, to be happening over two hours, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it just, 
I do think like some of the May stuff does take a little too long, and it it doesn't come back to that nearly enough. If you, if it really wanted that romance that it's trying to sell, uh, because there's a, like a lot of time where May's not even in the movie. Uh, it's presumed that basically their relationship is over and it just eventually towards the end of the movie that's where she comes back into it because she's kidnapped but I feel like the romance part of it is kind of wasted in this movie uh, even if they had just kind of left it out or just or just gone with the fact w- without even having like more of the the antics that occur like where she goes to Bali and she's pissed off and stuff Um, just just having it maybe be more about how he can't pivot from his police life which is often the case in like procedural type movies and shows where you have a police officer or a detective who literally like 20 hours of their day is devoted to working on cases it would make sense for her to be pissed off that you know basically he's constantly in danger there's constantly a threat to them being together I think that would make more sense than having the like very extended amount of um, exposition that we get about the relationship. Um, I think it's just a little bit wasted in this movie. Uh, and it would have left more room open for a more engaging storyline because I feel like the whole idea behind the blackmail is really, um, it's really bare bones. Like all we get is like these phone calls of threats of like the blackmail. And that's pretty much it. And there's really no, you know, there's not a lot of um, information about the the criminals, the reason, their motives. We only get that towards the end, and that's like kind of uh, just exposition that's dumped on you at the end. So I feel like the film could have made more use of uh, the criminal aspect to it, um, maybe setting up more interesting detective work because it really seems like they're just doing busy work for most of the movie instead of actually solving things um but i think like the ending of the movie is where it really goes it balls to the wall with the stunts because it does have a real a lot of really cool stunts at the end when they're in that like factory setting um, the film kind of gives you the perspective from the outside of like how high the film, the factory is and they're jumping through like slides and shit that are going to different levels of the factory. I can only imagine how close Jack Chan imagined Cave the Dying when he's sliding down that one slide in the detonation. I know, right? I mean, it's really Man, insane. Like, like, no, again, like you're wing- the stunts that he pulls off and how, like, you know, hands-on and choreographed, but also very tense they are. That, to me, is, like, one of the most, like, holy shit, he probably almost, he had to come close to I know, I mean, it's like, like, it's a really, I mean, it, the whole thing is really cool, like, the slide going through to the other area, and, you know, May does it, makes it through just fine and it's a it's a nice shot of her going through and then you see jackie's there's like the the bomb that's inside this the it, it looks really real um it's crazy it's like, it's like home alone too with the shoot that going down that you know <laughs> that's right yeah that's the the apartment shoot yeah um you know what i mean, you know what i was thinking was um when Jackie falls down the cement chute and he's hitting every like part as he's mm-hmm. going down. That's great too because that's like like that had to suck because he's definitely falling down and he's hitting each thing as he's going down and it's like that looks great. That has to really suck. I'm I I'm actually I'm glad that they showed some of the bloopers at the end in the credits. Well, Jake, I say all his films usually have like at the end like bloopers and like you know mishaps. Like I mean, you see a rush hour. That's like yeah, whole, you know, yeah. Because I mean, like you see, because I was thinking, um, there's that one scene where he like kicks the guy up and then he goes through the window and like smacks his head on the cement. And I was like, holy shit, that looked like real. Like he really actually smacked his head. And then you see in the bloopers, like no, yeah, he did. Yeah, like he fucking he fucking conked himself. You see, you see Jackie Chan with a needle like sewing his head back together. Like everything's fine. Yeah, 
Or like uh, the scene that's really cool too is when May is running through like those gates, those yeah, main gates. She trips over and then she's got like a giant wound in her throat. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's fucking. But like the end, the actual like scene itself came out really well because it's just like boop, 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 running through all of them. Looks really good. But then you see the blooper and it's like, yeah, that probably would have sucked to film, <laughs> you know. And not only that, but like she got hit in the head and then got to do it again. Um, there's so much, so much stuff that he does that's so timing based. It's like how, yeah. like how, like when you like this. I mean, this is in this film, but like all Jake Chan films, like when he jumps over something, he throws something perfectly at somebody. Like how many times does he have to do that take where he's like jumping over something and throwing something blind? And it's like, no, I missed you. Hold on, ready, do it again. And go, you know, oh, missed again. Hold on, ready, go, you know, until like you know, takes you under. It's like I hit you, gotcha. I mean, granted, I mean, I I believe Jackie Chan is such a coordinated son of a bitch. She probably gets on for a try, but oh, yeah, it, it, it is such a marvel, though. Like, the, I mean, God, God bless the people, like you know, who make these films, and especially the stunt work, who or who who are willing to be like, yeah, I'll, I'll take that fucking. Fallen ass over sea kettle from five stories and well i mean even in this movie there's a lot of scenes where he's like fighting fighting you know fight, fending off i think it was the one where everybody's got like the metal um like i don't know the what they were like knives yeah knives basically it's supposed, supposed to be like machetes kind of cause yeah talk about chopping them up but i think they're more they look like more like pvc pipe yeah that's kind of like it looks like pipe yeah but like he's you know he's he's fending them off beating them up and then there's like uh, bottles that they're throwing at him uh, that hit the wall, and that's all timing based because there's no cuts in like the editing. Yeah. It's all just like you know, do the choreography, boom, 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 boom. Then you know, dodge the glass that's coming at you. It's it's really awesome. Um, and you know, the, both Police Story and Police Story Two show the way that the choreography and the action come together to make a really interesting movie that doesn't necessarily like this is a. I, what I would say, like, I've seen a lot of, um, you know, Japanese samurai films and things like that from the seven, 60s and 70s, where it's very clear that all the choreography is, um, you know, planned out. right, exactly, planned and faked and things like that. With, with Police Story 2 and Police Story, you have choreography that looks really real, like things are playing out. I think the only thing that where that kind of uh, goes off the rails a little bit is when there's more of the goofy aspect of it, like when uh, that one henchman is constantly getting punched in the face where his glasses <laughs> break, you know? Well, no, not again. No, no. You know, <laughs> you know those, those are like more of the goofy moments where it's like not supposed to really look real. But other than that, um, you know, the film really never pulls its punches and it, it, it showcases how well choreographed it is. Um, and how fast paced it is. It's, it's really amazing to see, honestly. Uh, one, another scene that really stood out to me is when uh, the car's coming down the alley and he's like, has to run down the alley and jump up the. Jumps up perfectly to, yep. dodge, to dodge the, hit them hitting a wall, you know, mm-hmm. the wall of the building and then he kicks out the window. Yeah. It's like, it, it's like amazing just to see how well done that is. Um, so it's. I mean, so what I want to say is I don't think Police Story 2 is lacking in stunts. I think it still has a lot of really great stunts. It's just not to the caliber that Police Story had. Um, that movie had insane stunts. Um, and pretty much throughout the movie, it, it had those. Police Story 2 is a lot more tame in comparison. Um, they're, they're more like segmented. So you get like some stunts, some fighting, and then more scenes of them just doing investigative work and then some more stunts and, you know, so on. Um, and I think that maybe it just is unfortunate that it has to follow such a, you know, a great movie like Police Story. But I, I do think that Police Story 2 does, you know, pale in comparison to its predecessor. Um, what do you think about the uh, the music in this movie? Great. Yeah. Overbearing. <laughs> Always omnipresent, always there. But it's such like, like, when you think of like classic like eighty sounds, you're like, and you listen to music from that time, you're like, I don't hear that. Then you got this shit coming in. 
And then you're like, I now I hear it. Because, like, the classic, like, 80s sounds of, like, synth and, excuse me, all that kind of stuff. Stuff you kind of think of was never really used in, like, actual music. It was used in, like, soundtracks. And here it's, like, fucking great. Like, every time we see somebody, like, poking around the corner, you hear, ding a ding 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 And then every time you got May and Jackie together, you hear, Nice, nice little uh, something soft and yeah. You know. But the best part again is the revisiting and reuse of Jackie Chan's theme from Police Story One. So fucking motivational! I love it. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's not used as much in this film as in the first film, but like every time we hear theme. Ding, 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 bam, 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 you use it for the Rocky theme. It's, no, it is better than the Rocky theme. But, and then you hear, you know, Anthony's Jackie singing, Tangerine, Punjua. And it's like, yeah, this is Chinese anime. Let's go. Like, it's, it's, it's like, because it sounds like a shonen anime. <laughs> yeah, it does. But, but, you know, in Cantonese, it's just like, yeah, because, like, if you. Let's see the subtitles. You're like, it's like, stand up, man. You need to stand up and what you believe in. Don't let go. Fight for your woman because you're a man. And it's like, yeah. And, and honestly, no. too, what I was thinking, too, is uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the guy that was doing the sound effects put in a lot of work there. To get it all lined up, yeah. A lot of drum machines, a lot of, a lot of, and then like all the clangs during the the metal pipe what, scenes. Like, what, well, what about the fucking death guy? Who's? Oh man, I felt so bad in that scene because it that that does not hold up well at all with the fucking deaf guy. And they're all like, oh, I don't know. Let me just yell at this guy because he's deaf. It's hey. Not a great representation of a deaf person, to be honest with you. It doesn't matter. He's evil, so and he's building bo- RC bombs. So. Good lordy. What is the... Even my son, because my son was watching this, my three-year-old son was watching this, he was he was really mesmerized by all the action, but even my son at the end was like, why do they keep saying that? Like, bo 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 Why do they keep saying that? Like, I was like, and I was just like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> wait, 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 you've never seen the anime, Bo, Bo, Bo? Yeah, right. Bo, 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 Bo. No, I I did. I was like, oh, boy. Oh, the representation of the deaf person here. Good Lord. Yeah. I messed that up. It's not Bo, 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 Bo. It's Bo, Bo, Bo. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, honestly, too, I thought, like, they were going to go with the we you know with the deaf guy i thought they were gonna say like oh he's just faking it right like he's not really deaf no it takes you're right but it takes so long for them to get to like those as our villains and at that point it's like who the fuck cares mm-hmm. like they, they squander so much time like there is a lot of like good time like the whole like you know anytime we see that you know uh jackie chan talking to uncle bill and raymond you know and their discussions and like the whole like we failed. What are we going to do? And you hear Jackie Chan say, we're going to tell him we tried all that. <laughs> and we did the best we could. This is a hard case. We just need to work harder than crap. Yeah. And then Uncle Bill says, we need to try it all that. It's a tough kick. Great. I know. That is. Yeah. That is and then great. And as Raven comes in, because he's the superintendent, and they're like, he's like, well, he's not going to like that answer. Then Uncle Bill rattles that up. And then as... Raymond's superior, uh, you know, Superintendent Raymond's uh, superiors come in. And he's like, "We tried hard." We... <laughs> it does, like, it does have like a lot of good, like, little comedic moments like that. Like, they are really funny. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think sometimes the humor really does work. Um, it's just that this one is maybe a little bit goofier than the first one, and too, too quirky. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just a little bit too much. It's got just a little bit too much more comedy. The fart, the fart joke in the elevator, as funny as it was, yeah, you know, a little, a little too much. Because mm-hmm. it was on for like five minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's true. 
Yeah, and, and to be honest, like again, we watched the Japanese cut, which is just extended in its in itself, like longer. But I do think that for the Japanese cut that we watched, definitely too long at two hours. Um, as an hour and forty minute movie, maybe even just a little bit too long too. Uh, but but honestly, the I mean, the film I think is, you know, for for what it does, it does everything pretty well. Um, I just wish that it maybe focused on a little bit more of the the henchmen the the reasons for their you know for what they're doing um because it just doesn't have a lot of that um you know information presented to the audience um anything else that you want to talk about that we didn't cover probably like an hour (laughs) losing it now yeah, I don't. I I think we covered pretty much everything that I want to talk about. Like, yeah, I definitely wanted to get that deaf guy in. That was something that stood out to me. Super, super villain extraordinaire. I want to talk about the uh, the secretary who unfortunately lost her arm. Rest in peace. Yeah, it's terrible, and they don't come back to it either. There's like, yeah, she's gonna she lost an arm. She got she's gonna get a skin graft. You know, it would have made more sense if like the woman cop that she um. Uh... Jack Chan is starting to uh, become friends with. Like, if it was her to lose her arm, because, like, mm-hmm. you think, like, oh, him and May have broken up. He's found somebody, though, in the department, though, who's a woman who's also dedicated to being a cop. Like, you know. And yeah. It's like, it's like, no, it's just like, oh, random woman lost her arm and her face is burned. Send her a gift basket. How do you like, um, we didn't talk about this. How do you like how abrupt the ending is? It's just like fucking. It's fine, because, I mean, at the end, like, it's setting up for, like, the next one. Like, you, I can't believe you're blowing down a whole fucking water mill. <laughs> yeah. And killed some guys, too. Allegedly. Because there's, you know, that deaf guy that falls into the uh, barrels at the uh, bottom of the mill, and then they're just he leaving killed, there. Well, he killed all of them. The way, like, everyone that, the, the, the three guys fell out of the building, it's like they all died. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. He, like, super kicked one guy out the window, and he was falling <laughs> ass over tea kettle out the window, and then four stories high and lands on the ground. Like, oh, yeah. It's like when, you know, you see Batman do shit, and it's like, that shit kills you. Yeah. Oh, he's like, he's like, I don't know there's a terrible life. It's like, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so out of, um, so zero out of ten Jackie Chan mustaches. Beautiful. Love it. I'm going to give uh, Police Story 2 an 8 out of 10. I like this movie. I'm going to be honest with you. It's probably not an 8 out of 10. It's pro- but it's not a 7 out of 10. 7 and a half out of 10. It's in between. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bump it up by the grace of God. Um, like I said, I love the first Police Story. It's a great film. It's not just a great Jackie Chan film. It's not just a great a- 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 action film. It's a great film overall. Such great, you know, Jackie Chan did such great work on that. This film is fun. This film has a lot of good uh, stunts in it, a lot of good choreography, a lot of good ideas. It's a little bit too comedic. It's a, it leans a little bit too far into that. It's the stunts are a lot more simplified and not as daring. They're still very eye catching and enjoyable and cool, but the Nothing compared to the, to the first police story. The story is kind of a rambling mess. And maybe that's because, because again, the Max, when we watched on HBO Max, the cut's the Japanese cut, so it is extended. And usually when you see cuts set or longer in a film, it's usually the better cut. I think here it definitely suffers because there's a lot of downtime that's used throughout where it's just, Nothing bad that's happening, but nothing that's engaging and kind of like you know, you know, drive you know, drives away from what's supposed to be happening, what you're supposed to be engaged with. Um, I, like I would probably say it's like a seven point eight out uh, of ten, but I think it's good enough to uh, it's good enough to get an eight instead of rounding down. It's still fun. It's still a good film. Really, I mean, really good film. A lot of fun. I think again, Jackie Chan. God bless him. Such a nimble, agile, creative motherfucker. Does a great job directing. Does a great job writing. Does a great job acting. 
It's a great job of core, you know, sun, you know, core, you know, core, doing all the choreography, the action. He's got such a creative mind. Like I just, God bless him, because it's, I can't imagine having that kind of power. This is a very good film. Nowhere near as good as the first police story, but I think overall, in the grand scheme of action films, it's a damn good film. So I'd say eight out of ten. Yeah, I'd probably give it this a seven and a half out of ten. I think it's good. I don't think it's um as good as the first movie. Uh, I think again, like we said, we watched Japanese cut. It was it ran a little bit long, um, but for the most part, I I think that all of the things that made Police Story a good movie are here in some capacity. It's just missing a little bit of um like some of the stunt work and things that really made Police Story stand out. Um, it still has a lot of great stunts. Jackie Chan does a great job of the choreography. Um, what I think is probably missing is the storyline, which I think is a little bit too loose and too, um, basically just too, too simple for, for this movie. Uh, especially like with the black mill and extortion, I think like all the bombing elements to it are pretty interesting because the first movie doesn't deal with that at all. But, um, I don't feel like the story warrants like all of the stuff that they pull in. Like we can only have Jackie Chan working on this case and we need to pull in all these, you know, undercover beat cops. I, I don't think that the storyline really warrants that. And so I, I would have preferred to have had a much stronger story about, you know, this, whatever, um, uh, criminal enterprise was taking place. But other than that, I think that police story two is, really fun still um you know for an action movie i think it's a really great uh representation of a well choreographed movie that looks really real has a lot of um death defying dangerous stunts and uh it's a good continuation of the first police story it just doesn't reach the heights that that first one does so i, I can't remember what i gave the first one but i'm assuming it was higher than a seven and a half um, so I think seven and a half is fair for this one because it's still a good movie. It just doesn't, it didn't hit me the same way that the first one did. Apparently the, the soundtrack's completely different too. Oh, really? Hmm. Interesting. Maybe that's why the, uh, say that, which would explain because a lot of the sound effects and scores reused from the first film. So, mm-hmm. yep. The Japanese cut does a lot more, um, like, re, re, reminiscing, basically. You know, showing scenes from the, the first movie. So. Again, I think the Japanese cut's too long. I would recommend the Hong Kong cut. Even though I haven't seen it. I, would, I think the Japanese cut is just overall too long. So. Alright, what do we got next? What do we got next week for uh, Red Hot... 80s action month part three. Back you're gonna get hit. You're gonna get hit with so many rights. You're gonna be big. Ooh, is that so? Coming in, Chuck. Got some more Chuck for you. We're gonna be doing the first season of Walker Texas Ranger. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? Just like hit everything well, up with. Hold on. Can you imagine? I wish. Fucking how many? It was probably like 26 episodes or something, right? Yeah, it's like, oh man, I don't know. The first season is only 20, oh, it's 28 episodes. All right, never mind. Yeah, that's kind of long. Yeah, no, uh, probably not Walker, Texas Stranger, but what what do we got instead? Which Chuck are we doing? Delta Force. Delta Force. <laughs> you forgot. My guy couldn't remember. Is like, is it missing in action too? Will, will, yeah, no. Will will Chuck redeem himself? Do you think? You know, it's so funny. Like I said, like I get, I don't think I gave Invasion USA a great review. I think I found it kind of tedious. But missing an action is so much more tedious. I think in my mind, like I like now remember Invasion USA to be this monumental Criterion Collection of a film. So it's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> missing it, missing an action was definitely not. A great movie. 
I'll tell you what, though, to steal from Spoonie, because he hasn't done shit in, like, 20 years now. Uh, we need to bring back February. Yeah, Red Brown. You know what that is? Mm-hmm. Red Brown. Red, red, yeah, for February. For February. Yeah. We just Hush. do every week, do strike me. <laughs> Check out. Honestly, I'm I'm excited for Delta Force because I've never seen it before. I have. Again, I've again seen it like once, twice with Chuck movies. I, I'm not really well versed in Chuck either. They used so. to play that in the USA all the time. It is that like that in a Seagal film, right in line? Yeah. So no, none, you can you can laugh because Seagal's garbage. <laughs> well, you'll definitely want to want to listen to us talk about Delta Force. Do you want to announce what our last film is? Because we we're keeping a secret. We're gonna keep that until. Yeah, we'll end. keep it till the end. We'll yeah. keep it. We'll 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 announce it at the end of the last uh, next week's uh, episode. Mm. So yeah, but uh, if you want to hear Delta Force and hear what we finish off our Red Hot Eighties Action Summer Part Three Back to Duty season on, um, you can subscribe to us on pretty much any podcasting app that you can think of. We're on. Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, home base at anchor.fm, which is now Spotify. So subscribe. Leave us a nice review. Appreciate that. We're on Facebook and Twitter, or which is now called X. And we're on Threads. <laughs> uh, just search for us on there. Blood and Black Run Podcast. Don't use it a whole lot, but... The co-founders of Twitter did not like make the time to get tweets to be a fu- actual Oxford Dictionary word for Elon Musk, that fucking cunt to ruin it. So. I agree, I agree. It's crazy. <laughs> In the span of two weeks, he was like, ah, we're going to get rid of tweets and call our- ourselves X. Fucking undoing all, you know, 20, 15 years of work that they did at Twitter. So May that man have a fucking dildo with anal beat just plowing his ass I wouldn't even wish that because maybe he would like that. So no, something he, something much worse. No, because he wouldn't like it. He's very ace. ace. He's very ace. True. Asexual. He, I don't believe he actually really wants to have sex with people to have children like for a while. like, because that's going to be the world's threat. He's just like putting that on because he's a fucking robot billionaire douchebag. <laughs> um, and then you can uh, write to us at bloodandblackrumpodcast.com slash oh wait no, what did I say bloodandblackrumpodcast at gmail.com sorry um, let us know what you like what you don't like what you want to hear us cover keep that in mind and you can donate to us patreon.com slash bloodandblackrumpodcast anything you donate we'll put towards beer and we'll reimburse Martin for the $27 on seltzer that he spent so I'm gonna go down there and ask him for a refund <laughs> you should you should let's see how it See how they react. See, like, be like, excuse me. <laughs> I believe I deserve a refund. That's right. Um. All right, so yeah. We hope you uh, will stay tuned for our Red Hot 80s Action Month as it continues all August long. And uh, we'll be back next time with Delta Force. So, until then, take care.